So to turn to the topic uh, today, my presentation focuses on Kurdistani Jews, a diaspora of Judaism that was previously widespread across the mountains um, and largely ungovernable highlands of uh, southern Turkey, northwestern Iran, and especially northeastern Iraq. Prior to 1950, there were about 25,000 Kurdistani Jews scattered across approximately 200 settlements. But in the 1930s and 40s, uh, rising anti-Semitism in the Middle East, fueled in part by rising anti-Semitism in Europe, led to mob violence and increasingly draconian res uh, legal restrictions on Jews. In response, uh, the newly established State of Israel launched an initiative known as Operation Ezra and Nehemiah, which evacuated nearly all the Jews in the region and resettled them, as you can glimpse on the map to the right, in a variety of towns across its territory, where they remain today. As a consequence of this move, Kurdistani Jews are now nearly absent in their homeland. And there are no official figures uh, or census to go by. Um, and various news outlets speculate on numbers ranging from single digits to a few dozen or a few hundred families. But it's widely agreed that the community um, is now nearly non-existent, um, that villages where Jews were once a large uh, presence are now uh, almost entirely depopulated and that the remaining groups are aging rather quickly. The condition of Kurdistani Jews in the modern period contrasts sharply with Judaism in ancient and late antique Mesopotamia when it was flourishing. Prior to the uh, better known Jewish exile um, in the sixth century from Jerusalem to Babylon, in the eighth century, uh, several of the Israelite tribes were deported by the kings of Assyria um, and resettled north and east of the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, or modern day Mosul. Um, I piece one of the relevant passages up on the slide. Um, some of the names there, um, such as the Habur, the cities of the Mies, northwest Iran, will recur later uh, in, in the um, documents that uh, we'll examine. But unfortunately, there isn't a direct link between the story of the deportation and the modern, modern uh, Kurdistani Jewish community, um, but there is significant overlap in terms of location. The picture is complicated as well by the fact that during the late antique period from approximately 200 to 700, um, the Jewish community of Mesopotamia was um, popular. It attracted converts from a variety of its neighbors, Arabs, Arameans, Persians, um, and also Kurds. In fact, there's a specific debate in the Talmud, um, which was written during this period about whether Kurds could convert to Judaism with the conclusion being that um, eventually that they, they could be accepted unconditionally. And we don't know the exact numbers of people who are converting, um, but it's important to note that at this point, just before the Islamic conquest, some of the mountain peoples are turning from their ancestral religion and embracing Judaism. So uh, when Islam comes to the region in the uh, mid seventh century CE, um, there's a melange of Jewish influence and culture that's been percolating in the region um, for a millennium, for a few generations in various waves and forms. Now, despite this period of fluorescence, studying Kurdistani Jews soon runs into a complication. Uh, almost no source material survives from the community prior to the 16th century, either literary in the form of documents or manuscripts or material in the form of religious objects or buildings. In fact, our earliest extensive descriptions are from two outsiders, um, European Jewish travelers who visit the area at almost the same time. Benjamin of Judela from Navarre, in modern day Spain, who arrives in 1173, and Pataki of Radisbein from the Holy Roman Empire, um, now modern day Germany, who arrives about 20 years later. Um, for the sake of this brief presentation, I'm only going to deal with Benjamin, whose descriptions are much more vivid and uh, contain much more material. Um, but these two sources are generally the starting point for most scholars in describing the community. Um, 
Benjamin has some very interesting material on criticizing Jews, but the passage that I put up on the slide has the most relevant geographic details. He starts out by mentioning Ahmadiyya, or modern day Ahmadi in uh, Iraq, and describes a string of 100 Jewish settlements um, where they speak Aramaic, the language of the Targum. Um, these settlements stretch all the way to Iran, some 25 days away, and then curve south to Hamadan. In Hamadan, he says there's another very sizable community of Jews and also a shrine to Mordecai and Esther. Um, now, I've chased out the, the area on, on uh, Google Maps that Benjamin describes, um, and taken literally, it's about 30% longer than Israel. And as you can see, it's also very massive. He also um, mentions Jews beyond these areas, of course. Um, his numbers shouldn't be taken literally, either in terms of distance, the number of settlements, or the number of people. They're nice round numbers, um, but they give a very um, nice impression of a massive amount of territory, large numbers of people, um, and settlements uh, scattered across uh, quite a large range. There are also uh, other communities living aside Jews in this region in the medieval period, particularly three, uh, Zoroastrians, Muslims, and Syriac and Armenian Christians. Uh, Syriac Christians, who represent the largest Christian group in the region, speak Aramaic like their Jewish neighbors rather than Kurdish. And at least in the 19th and 20th century, all these communities were highly intermixed. Um, there are a lot of stories about celebrating religious festivals together, uh, living in the same villages. On the left of the slide, you can see uh, a street plan of Zako, which was previously known as the Jerusalem of Kurdistan. Um, currently, it has no Jewish population, but um, the Jewish neighborhood is still demarcated um, and existed alongside houses and neighborhoods belonging to other faiths. Um, while there are uh, almost no Kurdistani Jewish sources, there are medieval sources from both Muslims and Syriac Christians, which date earlier than Benjamin's narrative and can expand our knowledge of Jewish history in this region. And so that'll be a focus for the rest of the presentation. Starting with the Muslim sources, I examined four geographic works dating from the late 9th to the 13th century. Most of these were interested in mapping the Islamic world as the territory of the Muslim faithful um, from Spain to North Africa to Central Asia. They have relatively little to say about religious minorities. But one of them, al Muqaddisi, writing in the middle of the 10th century, states at the beginning of his book that he is interested in a very different project, one that shows where Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians live, and in many cases outnumber Muslims. And he uh, states up front that he'll highlight their descriptions um, and their demographics without prejudice or partiality, though he reserves the right to mention their merits and defects as well, um, which makes him a very useful basis of comparison uh, with Benjamin's narrative later. Um, now, al Muqaddisi's description of the Islamic world as a whole largely corroborates uh, what Benjamin mentions. He identifies large Jewish communities in Yemen, on the southern edge of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, in Nishapur, in East Central Iran, and in various parts of Syria and Egypt. I haven't focused on these passages because they extend outside of my immediate area of interest, which is Kurdistan, but he provides some external non-Jewish validation for some of Benjamin's claims. Um, unfortunately, he tends to generalize by region, making his descriptions broad and impressionistic rather than precise. But he makes a striking comment that in the area that Benjamin described in Northwestern Iran and Northeastern Iraq, um, Jews are the majority, even more so than Christians, who are normally the majority in other places of the Islamic world. And while he doesn't mention the shrine of Mordecai and Esther that Benjamin references, he does describe the Kurdistani Jewish shrine at Holwan between Iraq and Iran. He describes Holwan as a hub city, partly in the mountains, which is situated at the intersection of eight roads, two of which are named the Road of the Jew and the Road of the Jewish Woman. And he says that there's an important temple there, which is a regional attraction for the Jewish population. 
He also adds, so he doesn't think this is this temple is as impressive as uh, Jerusalem, uh, probably the, the Dome of the Rock, which he describes in loving detail in his um, Jerusalem passage. Um, but again, he adds to the important external validation of Benjamin's claims of a large prominent Jewish community in this specific area. Uh, the Muslim geographers also provide another detail um, consistently that doesn't factor into Benjamin's description of Jews in this region, which is a close association between Jewish communities and cloth making and cloth selling throughout the Middle East. Uh, al Muqaddisi mentions this specifically for several cities west of Mosul and south of Baghdad. And another geographer, Imin Halkal, who writes about 30 years after al Muqaddisi, mentions that there's a large Jewish community in Southern Armenia and that they specialize in dyeing a vivid red color, um, kermes, which is the, the Persian word that gives us crimson. Uh, you can see a picture of some of this cloth on the right from um, Northern Iran in the 1970s as well. One of the other Jewish centers is uh, mentioned for dyeing um, a pure white color, although the association is a little bit less. And this detail links very closely with the uh, modern Kurdistan and Jewish diaspora. When they fled in the 1950s, weaving and cloth selling were still the main occupations besides agriculture and some small craft um, It was practiced by both men and women and often sold to Christian and especially Muslim leaders. So this added detail from a thousand years before um, from these 10th century Muslim sources provides a sense of the long durée of the region and some of the rhythms and um, niches that Jews carpet. Now, Omar Qadisi had promised to reveal where all the Jewish, Christian, and Zoroastrian communities were without prejudice, but he makes some major omissions. And one of these is his description of the area north of uh, Mosul, the site of ancient Nineveh, where um, he gives several details, but doesn't mention Jews at all. Um, but for this area, there's some information about Judaism from uh, Syriac monastic chronicles from the early Islamic particularly the ninth century. These sources are a little bit different. Unlike Muslim geographers, they don't set out to construct a comprehensive map or vision of the world. Instead, they primarily, primarily concern themselves with highly localized anecdotes about Christian holy men or Christian monasteries uh, up in the mountains. And their references to their Jewish neighbors are often very broad and indirect. Um, some of these are references to shared shrines. So as was prevalent in the region up until the 20th century, Jews, Muslims, and Christians frequently visited each other's holy sites. And in the monastic chronicles, um, this usually takes the form of Jews visiting the monasteries, but not much more detail here. Uh, you can see a Jewish site, which is shared by Christians and Muslims uh, to the right, the shrine of Nahum at Al-Kosh, some miles north of Mosul which is now going, um, undergoing an extensive renovation. Um, another reference in these chronicles mentions a Christian bishop whose diocese is experiencing famine. Uh, in his search for relief, he decides to visit a place called the Hesna Ibrahim, um, the Hebrew fortress or, or stronghold, um, to ask for assistance for his flock, which he receives. Uh, these are only incidental references, but they establish the sense that Jews are um, an important part of this world. Uh, and there's another story that illustrates this point indirectly, but rather intriguingly. It describes uh, some medieval Syriac Christian missionaries who journeyed from their home in Beth Ave, again north of Mosul, to a region near the Caspian Sea in order to make converts to Christians. When they arrive, they experience culture shock because the inhabitants of the region are completely polytheistic. And uh, there are a couple different versions of the story, but there's a remarkable line which describes the area as being uh, um, empty or destitute or lacking in Muslims and Jews who confess the one God who created the heavens and the earth. And this is remarkable partly because it suggests a kind of um, rough equivalence between monotheists regardless of confession, as opposed to polytheists. But also because it's telling that the element that the missionaries feel is most lacking in the region 
um, are the people that presumably they lived alongside. Um, that without Muslims and Jews there, it felt like something was missing. And again, the sort of indirectly hints at how interwoven these communities were um, and how integral Jews were in um, the Syriac imagination. So to conclude, these are sources that don't typically fall into the radar of Jewish studies scholars. And they offer um, only passing references to, to Jews, but they complement each other in terms of the location of medieval Kurdistani Jews and also build on um, more extensive description provided by Benjamin two centuries later. They also contain points of continuity with Benjamin and with modern ethnographic sources about the social and commercial roles that Jews had carved out for themselves, about a sacred geography that's unique to Kurdistan, and most significantly about a much larger population spread across a much larger area than the reduced figures from the 1950s and especially the modern period suggests. And after some 2,800 years of presence in the area, and after having established such a deep rooted and lasting culture, um, I think it's only fair to paraphrase Talos Samarga and to say that um, the area itself and uh, medieval studies feels empty. Thank you very much.